This is <clears throat> Tom Duty, middle-aged American living in New Jersey near the Lincoln Tunnel. If you were to visit my website, you would type Howdy Duty into Google. You'll find the correct spelling of the famous puppet. You then combine Tom Duty in a Google search from my site. I'm in South Africa, Cape Town, South Africa. Been here for several days. Uh, I'm with my wife, Hannah, in an Airbnb. Our hosts are lesbians. Uh, so I'm in a bed. Uh, Hannah is on the couch, not awake. And uh, I'm in the bed that is normally occupied by lesbians. Cape Town, South Africa. South Africa nationally is liberal, politically liberal. Now, many people that predicted President Trump would be elected did so on the idea that this idea that there's a pendulum that swings. Uh, Trump had uh, catered to and appealed to a very uh, conservative political thinking, and the people that predicted he would win, uh, in addition to being right, we're also uh, acknowledging that you swing, it's typical to swing from uh, extreme liberal to ex extreme conservative, which is exactly what's happened here in South Africa. Apartheid, which I sort of understood, but not like I do now. I've been to museums about slavery, and I've also been to museums about apartheid, and it is both based on social problems stemming from racism, uh, Slavery is more than racism. Slavery, uh, leveraging racism as a as a point of distinction, um, and and racism is what is the underlying sentiment of apartheid. So, to go from prohibiting public gathering to suppression of state controlled media to literally forcefully relocating th tens of thousands of people um, and classifying them, formally classifying them by the state, whether they are uh, colored, which is neither black nor white, uh, white or black. So like, for example, we've had several Congolese drivers. The Congolese are dark-skinned black people and they are not considered colored. They are black uh, in the South African formal uh, classification, which doesn't exist today formally, but it still exists today informally. And colored is everyone else. Like I'm, of course, white, Caucasian, um, and, and, and uh, Asian, Indian, Indonesian, uh, anyone who is has black and white ancestors enough to look like Barack Obama, Michelle Obama, or Oprah, uh, or any of the, the Jay Z, any of the uh, LeBron James, any of the American people that we consider black in South Africa are not black; they are colored. So this is a residual distinction uh, made talked about alive today in a casual way in South Africa, and it is a residual product of the formal uh, institutionalized state-run uh, racial discrimination of apartheid. So again, you go from a, a government that institutes apartheid, and now you swing significantly liberal. So this couple that is host of ours is able to live openly gay lives. Uh, I don't know if they're married or not, but it is legal that they could be married. Uh, when I landed in Johannesburg, the uh, newspaper, a free newspaper called the Sunday Times, opened it up. I didn't even have to open it up. The front page story was about corruption and uh, a, a court case that an email had come to light that uh, uh, revealed a uh, bribe money paid from a state official, from a rich person to a state official. This email uh, proposing this deal and the tracks to cover it up. That email got in the hands of the Sunday Times and was disclosed. This is a country under apartheid that just had horrible, dark secrets. And now things like this are on the front page. Page three, page front page one. I'm going to call that front page, then one, then two, then three, then four maybe of this paper, first section. Uh, is the story about pedophilia. Now, I didn't read the story, but obviously 
someone is accused of being a pedophile. Uh, and of course, that person is probably a man, but I didn't even read that much. He is, uh, uh, you know, will he face prosecution? I don't know. But certainly in the press, uh, an accused pedophile is generally considered a pedophile socially, even though he's not prosecuted. So my point is, is that this it's, it's another representation of the political swing from many dirty secrets to wide public disclosure, from no public gathering to common protest, from state filtered media to the kind of the Sunday Times that I just described. So this is really remarkable for me. It's refreshing. It's, uh, I don't know how to describe it. I'm going to move on to my point. The target audience of this message is, I'm going to put this link on a group that's in Facebook that is intended to capture uh, the descendants of my ancestors, my, my uh, dad and his two sisters. It might technically, the ancestors would be their parents, but most of us never knew their parents. So my father, Bill, Mary Lou, and Talene were his sisters. All of those descendants, the mother and fathers of those descendants. <coughs> so my message for you is I'm the youngest of my generation. So if we pass from this earth, if we die in the order we were born, then I'll be the last survivor. I um, want uh, some message on racism to be able to intellectualize and handle racism in an emotional way that is somehow survivable, that is somehow useful, that is somehow practical and somehow reduces it. So I literally mean this. I felt this on this uh, vacation and and I believe that everyone in this world uh, could experience something like I've experienced on this trip and, and, and take a nip out of racism in, a, in an important personal and maybe broader way. So here it is. Racism is a really tough topic for untold reasons, countless reasons. But two of them is the intersection of emotional and intellectual. So to go to one extreme, again, I'm kind of in this, let's go here and let's go here. To go from one extreme, about 100% emotional and 0% intellectual, now that we have these viral vids that are just so common, I don't have to refer to a specific one because so many of them follow this pattern. A black person will be told, this is U.S., black person will be told by a white person, uh, in a confrontational way, go back to go back to Africa. And I've heard specifically black people say, and you know, I've never been to Africa. And in addition to not being from Africa, my, my ancestry goes back in the United States about a, uh, about a century and maybe two decades before, before I am a descendant of immigrants. My ancestry is a little bit cloudy, but it's somewhere around a century and a, a quarter. And uh, most black people, though they, like me, don't know their ancestry way back. Uh, this is not like British royalty that can trace it back, you know, like 20 generations. Uh, they're in a similar situation with me. But, but chances are their ancestry goes back, you know, another century and a half beyond mine. So if I credit myself with a century and a half, most black people in America have another century and a half. They're twice what I am. They're talking about 300 years before their ancestors would be uh, not just enslaved. You would go back only a century to get enslaved, century and a half to get enslaved people. But you go back three centuries before you actually have people that were descendants of people that were brought here by the slave trade. So again, that example is people that say, go back to Africa in anger, contempt, and confrontation in a threatening manner. And the black person that says, I've never been to Africa. I'm not from Africa. These people are Americans. So that represents an exchange that is 0% intellectual. Obviously, the person that says it just has no fucking clue, no intellectual sense in that statement at all. It is pure stupidity. It's like the earth is flat. Okay, it's not. And this person you're insulting, if you would pull your head out of your ass, you idiot who says it, the person's never been to Africa. And if you could make some rough calculations, a person is an American, he's a black American, 
<coughs> you could probably do some calculations that this person is not from Africa. Do you hear a French accent? Do you hear any accent that sounds like anyone who's been anywhere but in America? That person is probably not from Africa. So in other words, there's no intellectual thinking in that statement. It's a seeing black skin. It's representing uh, that person is a, a descendant of people who are from Africa by some way through the slave trade in some way or directly from Africa, more likely the former, less likely the latter. And that represents a, a statement of contempt and anger and zero intellect, 100% emotion, pure stupidity, no intellectual thought, premeditation in that statement. So now you go to the other side and you talk about an experience like I had this week visiting both a slave uh, called the Slave Lodge and a uh, a museum dedicated to apartheid. They are distinctly different, but very related. There's so many things that go into what I'm going to say right now, but one map talks about the flow of slaves and the, tra the slave trade and how it, where people came from and where they were traded, where they went to after that becomes an exponential calculation beyond but uh, Cape Town, specifically South Africa, it's Cape Town, and specifically where I was, was a major slave port for what's called the Dutch East India Company. And these slaves came from India, Indonesia, Madagascar, uh, Angola, but that kind of died pretty soon. They found they could get more slaves easier if they went further. Angola is just uh, up the Atlantic coast, one country. Or two countries, it's Angola and Namibia, then Angola. So this is a show of the flow of slaves. My point is this, if you take an intellectual investment into slavery and the slave trade and to understand where people came from and where they might have been traded and think you have some sense of what slavery is and what it was like to survive slavery. Uh, it, it is just horrific. I mean, women would give birth to babies, nurse those babies. They would be young children and they would be taken from them. There was no, no attempt to unite them with their family. No attempt to even keep the same names. Uh, those children were born into slavery. A mother would give birth to a child, nurse that child, and that child was by state proclamation and by the practices of 300 years, that child would become the property of someone else taken from her. Maybe she'd see the child again, maybe not. No promises, no trace to that child's origin and uh, absolutely horrific. And the movement of people who were enslaved uh, is really complex. So the idea in the U.S. is that the people, most of the people in the U.S. that were enslaved, who were enslaved, came from Liberia. Now, there was an attempt to send black people back to Liberia after emancipation. <coughs> and it, it, it wasn't a great idea. It wasn't a disaster. Some people went and never came back, and some people went. And I've talked to some people who were the sons and daughters of people who went to Liberia, and they came back to the U.S. They felt like they never belonged in Liberia even though the two people I talked to, their parents stayed. So my point is, if you take an intellectual investment in slavery, it still leaves you way short of being able to engage and being able to handle the emotional side. The emotional side is going to be better handled if you're more intellectually invested. However, nothing can prepare you in your conversation. It's just too emotional. And so to be afraid to engage in apartheid, in uh, Phil Crow of the United States and, and the residual racism left after slavery, <coughs> to be afraid to engage in slavery, to be afraid to talk about the Civil War in the United States, to be afraid to talk about apartheid is a bad idea. To feel like you're intellectually prepared to engage in those topics is equally bad. To be prepared is one thing. To be sure you're right is impossible. There is just so much not known. So as soon as you get an engagement with someone who is willing to talk about the topic in an intellectual manner, unlike, again, more like this, intellectual, less like this, go back to Africa, like the American uh, 
anger vids between white people and black people. When the white person says, go back to Africa, that represents zero intellectual, 100% emotion. So, okay, let's dial the emo intellectual component up. Now we're going to be better. But I, I, listeners, I promise you, you'll still be left short. It's just too complex where people came from and the idea that we can classify people. You know, Martin Luther King, I, I have a dream about the one day when my uh, sons and daughters uh, will be uh, judged by the color, the, judged by the content of their character and not by the color of their skin. And still today, we're trying to judge people by the color of their skin, just like in apartheid, you're black, you're colored, you're white. And they had a, a systematic uh, institutionalized practice of doing that formally, classifying people. They had ID cards that said what they were. Even if they visibly appear to be something different, they could be classified as something else. So a white person could be classified as colored if he or she was married to a black person. That would keep that person's classification consistent with the rest of his or her family, her son, their sons, his or her sons, his or her daughters, and the spouse. So the classification didn't always meet the color of the skin. The bottom line is this, racism is a volcano ready to erupt and to constantly avoid the topic is a mistake to engage being ensure you you're intellectually prepared for the topic is an equal mistake there's just too much not known so looking forward i'll give an example dna testing in the u.s is going to allow a lot of black people to be able to trace a little bit to kind of know where they're from well, what I learned today in the Slave Trade Museum of, of Cape Town, South Africa, is that that DNA testing will sometimes allow people to pinpoint where they're from. Maybe Madagascar. And from what I know of DNA, roughly speaking, and what I saw on this board today, maybe some of these people, some black Americans, some colored Americans is how they'd say it in, in uh, South Africa. But it, well, as Americans, we think of these people as black. Again, Oprah, Barack Obama, I think Michelle Obama, LeBron James, and so on. <clears throat> these people would be considered color in South African black in the United States. These people, some of them might be able to find uh, their origin in where their enslaved ancestors came from. Uh, but in large sense, there's been so much uh, uh, intermarriage uh, that the results are likely to be inclusive, conclusive. So my point is, if you dial up your in intellectual engagement in this topic and you feel like you're ready to talk about it, and all of a sudden someone says, you know, I know I'm from um, Ethiopia. Well, you know what? From what I know about Ethiopia, they kind of didn't get touched in the slave trade. Okay, so I'm probably wrong. But let's say I'm right. Let's say it, 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 someone with an advanced degree in the transatlantic slave trade says, you know what, it's just not likely your descendants came from Ethiopia. You know, a stupid person, even though you dial up your intellectual powers on this topic, it would still be foolish to insist that you know that that can't be true. If someone has a DNA test to say that it is true, then to them it's true, and it's a point not worth arguing. But the topic in total is very worthwhile. Racism is, is incredible. The residual effect it's had on the world me sitting in a very politically liberal country, largely credited to Nelson Mandela and other legal leaders of the anti-apartheid movement, um, are, are basically the civil rights movement of South Africa that would be akin to Medgar Evers, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, and other people that can put their names on the civil rights movement of the 60s. Meanwhile, we were going through that and roughly the same time, uh, no, actually later, but in a similar greater uh, era, uh, South Africa was going through anti-apartheid. Apartheid is incredible. It would compare to the United States Jim Crow. I learned much about it during this stay, and uh, I just truly love this place. Thank you for listening. So here I am from the bed of lesbians talking about political liberal life. It's been Tom Duty, middle-aged American living in New Jersey near the Lincoln Tunnel. If you were to visit my website, you would type Howdy Duty into Google. You'll find the correct spelling in the famous puppet. You then combine Tom Duty in a Google search for my site. 
Thank you for listening. Have a good day. Good evening. A restful night's sleep. Ciao. I'm going to do an addendum. <coughs> a completely different topic. Scarface. Now, Hanna, we, Hanna and I have become cult repetitive watchers of Scarface. Obsessed in details of the movie. So in the bathtub scene, Tony Montana is flipping through stations. And at one point he says, Manny, look at the pelicans. Now to understand this joke, you got to understand the difference between a flamingo, a pink flamingo, and a pelican. So Manny, so Tony Montana says, Manny, look at the pelicans as the stations flip by real quickly. Well, they weren't pelicans. They were pink flamingos. And so again, Tony Montana's legendary character, his intellectual power relative to the ability to identify pelicans and distinguish them from pink flamingos uh, fell short. It ends up being quite a funny moment, quite a funny moment. The man's obsessed about um, money. He's accused of being boring by his wife in that same scene because he's only obsessed about money and he obviously needs a little zoological training. Great moment. Funny, funny, funny moment. Great movie. Masterpiece movie. Ciao.